Welcome to the sixth plenary of the 2022 International Conference on Sustainable Development. Our topic is Translational Knowledge to Shape Sustainable Urban Futures. It's my great pleasure to turn us over to our moderator, Dr. Aramar Revy, Director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Aramar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. So uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to join you wherever you are in the world. I know some people are up very late at the moment, like many of us in New York, and others are just starting their day. So we're going to be running this webinar on translational knowledge to shape sustainable urban futures. I have with me a spectacular panel of colleagues who've been working on this theme for many years, but very closely over the last five. Uh, we have Professor Michael Keith from the University of Oxford in the UK. Professor Sue Parnell from the University of Bristol and also the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Professor Pang Zhang Zhou from uh, Peking University in China, who's also the chief editor of you know, a key urban journal in this called Cities. And Professor Juan Carlos Duque from uh, EFET University in Colombia. Now, all of us have been working together with a very large team over the last five years as part of the Peak Urban Program that basically brings together uh, work in five different uh, countries, four different continents, and is sort of embedded in uh, in work in, let's say, in four cities, in Beijing, in Bangalore, in Cape Town, um, and uh, in Medellin, in, in Colombia. And we've been trying to understand how sustainable urban futures would play themselves out. This is, of course, in the context of the uh, sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 11, which focuses on sustainable cities and uh, communities. And the reason that I think this is important is, you know, uh, about five years ago, a number of us, including Sue and myself, actually put together a massive open online course, which looked at sustainable cities and communities and tried to introduce um, the, you know, them and the ideas to the world. It was pretty much shot in every continent, including uh, in, 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 in many of the countries we're talking about just now. Uh, and it's done pretty well. At the moment, uh, it's on the STG Academy work uh, website. Uh, there are over, I would say, maybe 40, 45,000 people who registered with this on this course. And it gives you a good understanding of the basics of, um, of, you know, of sustainable cities and the key elements and the debates that took place uh, while the SDGs were being framed and su subsequently from that. At the current point of time, we're almost at the halfway mark between 2015 and 2030, and there are a whole range of new challenges that are uh, kind of emerging. And this MOOC will try and address them based on empirical knowledge from some of the sort of leading universities in the world who work on these questions and have worked together with a whole range of researchers, practitioners to try and understand what's happening. We'll be considering sort of three themes at the moment um, to look at three challenges and opportunities. The first is the core challenge of generating this translational research that brings together research from multiple disciplines on a whole range of new cutting edge themes and linking that with what we call new urban sciences, which is in a sense, the foundational knowledges that will allow us to try and interrogate and address uh, you know, the wicked problems of dealing with sustainable cities, both now and in the future. The second question, of course, is the core challenge of addressing the global urban agenda, which is the SDGs and a whole range of things that are tied to that, including the Paris Climate Agreement, Sendai, um, and the new urban agenda, which kind of underpins that process, to link you know, the global urban agenda and the opportunity of international collaborations, uh, which, are, which are actually localized, which are actually grounded in national and city contexts. So basically connecting local processes uh, and local initiatives with global science and global institutions. And the third one is a question of how one connects practices on the ground. And you know, there are a whole range of practices that are there in each of the uh, countries we're talking about, tremendous, uh, interesting new challenges and sort of innovations are being played themselves out. China, of course, is the most dramatic. Uh, we've seen, I would say the largest urbanization in history happening over the last 30 odd years in China. So how does one take the practices from that, uh, contrast that with the history of, let's say, urbanization and urban processes in the Americas and in Europe, which happened a little bit earlier, and of course, the hyper-urbanization that we've seen in Latin America over the last few decades. So how does one link that with, uh, with using research uh, and bring that together with practice to shape 
uh, urban futures. So that's the broad context. We'll try and use these sort of three themes, th themes of translation research, the connections of the, uh, the global urban agenda, uh, global science and institutions, and practice and shaping urban futures um, together. Now, the important thing that's emerged over the last five years is the question of international cooperation in trying to make this possible. In fact, I would say it's, it's much more than international cooperation. This is a process that has enabled us to bring together uh, you know, a whole range of researchers. Some people who've been working in this space for decades, uh, plus a whole range of younger people, uh, postdoctoral uh, scholars, uh, people who are actually doing their doctors and master students, to enable them to work across these geographies and address a range of you know, core questions which underpin the connection between new urban science, sustainability science, and of course, emerging questions like, uh, like, like, like climate change. So um, to kick things off, in some senses, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of request Michael to sort of dive in and give us some sense of how the PEAK program uh, has kind of underpinned the knowledges that have helped us create the MOOC and how the process of building the MOOC has enabled uh, a very wide engagement uh, with, with research questions and application across the world. So uh, over to you, Michael, all yours. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to all the, 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 the colleagues and our hosts today for, for this launch. The, the, the launch of the, the Shaping Urban Futures uh, course, the, the MOOC, which is on Coursera now that we're launch, launching today, as Arrow says, is the product of an extraordinary collaboration between colleagues who are here many colleagues who, who aren't here. And I guess what we all shared through, throughout this whole process was a, a disposition, if you like, a way, a way of thinking about the challenges of the, of the future and particularly the challenges for future cities, precisely because the, the scale of change and the pace of change creates certain kind of dynamics about the way we think about cities. We know that cities are uh, not just systems, but they're systems of systems, that they're, they're sites in which different systems interface, transport systems, health systems, economic systems, ecological systems. And we know that they're, they're, by, uh, they're unstable in some ways. So some of the paradoxes of, of the way we think about urban futures are on the one hand, as I'll say in just a second, we know an awful lot more and more about the very short term. It is possible to use new ways of gathering data, new ways of analyzing data, to know an enormous amount about the short term future. But as the pace of change accelerates sometimes, it means that it sometimes is simultaneously the case that we know less and less about what happens over the longer, the longer term. It's also the case that we're very committed, as you can see from the people in front of you in the MOOC itself and in the work we did on, on the Peak Urban Program, to try and both recognize the historical legacies that confront every city, the geographical specificities of every city, but at the same time try and build a form of inquiry that actually tries to have some fundamental ways of translating research into practice. The title of this session is, is Translational Research. And what we mean by that is how we think about how research can move from the ivory tower into practice, but also from the, the field into the ivory tower. We're talking about relations between uh, people who are finding solutions on the ground and academics as much as a direction of travel that just goes the other way. So the way in which our program was designed was both to, to combine a sense of the ways in which new, new forms of methodologies, new ways of thinking about the cities, what we're calling the new urban sciences, lend us a sense of, of prediction, the P of an acronym, the P-E-A-K, but at the same time, precisely because cities are changing so fast, they are always, particularly at the interface between different systems, the sites of newness coming into the world, a sense of emergence, which is where the E comes from. And at the same time, we also acknowledge that cities are not straightforwardly um, technical systems or social systems, they're socio-technical systems. Part of the disruptions of cities are, are driven by technological change and the way those changes are adopted and how we make sense of these changes actually demands a parity of esteem between different kinds of analytical lenses, different dis academic disciplines, how one brings together engineers, and architects and demographers 
and, and health specialists means that we need to think about how the different forms of valuation, the values at the heart of different ways of seeing the city, create trade-offs between different ways of thinking about the city. So with the way we talk about this is that we, we suggest that alongside uh, a sense of trying to understand how the city works, the analytical questions of how the city works, we need to think simultaneously about the normative questions, the way in which we want the city to appear in the future, to think about in whose image the city will be made. So those normative questions and those analytical questions also set up a further dimension for us that, that informs the MOOC, that we need to also think about the operational space at which we operate. The fact that at times this is at the scale of the community, right the way down at the low scale, working with people, co-producing ways of short, shorter term or longer term solutions to problems. Other times it's at the scale of the city or maybe the city region, but it may also be at the level of the nation state. And clearly part of what we're interested in is thinking about how we build from these building blocks, a global urban agenda that isn't about imposing upon cities across the world a single way of thinking, but is using what we call this urban disposition to think about an approach to urban futures, a way of thinking about urban futures that recognizes that China is very different from Europe, that's very different from India, that's very different from the experiences of Latin America or North America for that point. And it's that, it's that disposition that kind of lends, I think, our, our MOOC a particular value, precisely because we read across different sites, not to synthesize them or to compare them, but to try and learn from those differences and that diversity. And so hopefully, Ara, that gives you a sense of how I think our, our collaboration has, has fed into this over the, the last few years. And I mean, one way that it's been done, uh, Michael, is actually in the structure of the course, where you start with how to know the city, and then, of course, ask the question of what it is to know, and, or know that's worth knowing in the city. And then, of course, how cities are changing, because there's tremendous disruption of both social technical systems and social ecological systems. And finally, asking the really big question, which I think is critical not only for cities now, but over the rest of the century, and that is, can cities transform themselves? And can they help sort of transform uh, the future in, in, in some senses in a very concrete way. So, uh, Pangjung, just to come, come to you here, like I said, uh, you know, China has gone through the largest sort of urbanization in all of history. It's transformed itself. It's transformed its urban landscape in some senses. So we'd really like to hear from you why China is important, uh, how urbanization in China is different, and how the new urban sciences that are emerging in China have a lot to give to the world and what we can learn from that and you know how your own research and practices uh, sort of connect with these with these questions so all yours okay thanks thanks amara so uh, yeah everyone who's actually said uh, china now this has become the one of largest the city where the uh, you know so urban cities uh, urban residents live in so actually in the past 20 years each year on average it's, uh, it looks that it's 10 million people is moved from rural to the cities. So, and I still remember, you know, now I talked with my researchers from, uh, from Europe and he talked, he told me, if you want to, you know, see, if you want to observe organization, uh, organization pr pr precise, lively, and uh, with one uh, big case, China could be a good case. Of course, there are other cases because in a very short period, there's a large and a big, huge changes. And these changes, you know, it's cover a lot of different aspects. The people move from rural to cities, but, uh, you know, and in China, the situation is that many of my family still have land in rural areas. They keep land there. So you will see, and uh, some researchers call that half organization or something organization because you see young people leave the city the parents still in you know, a rural area so that's that's a lot of challenges for example aging in rural areas because the older people they live in the rural area and also for the young for, for cities the cities become very young and cities grow very fast and also the young people they uh, adapt to new technologies very very fast you see in cities the people use that more 
mobile phone and a lot of new technical communication ways everywhere. So that's also bring new challenges to, to our pl urban planners. So how we can make this young people or young generation uh, uh, urban citizens be happy or be familiar with this uh, new situations. So, you know, so, so, so for urban science, when we, when, we, when we call it in China, we, we do need to cooperate with our international partners because each, you know, for urban science, I think one of important research direction or one is uh, it's, uh, how we can achieve some general rules of urban growth. So we need to find some general rules or general laws for urban growth. So you know that probably uh, European, uh, European, particularly UK cities already in a very high uh, level of urbanization or very high uh, uh, a mutual state, state. I call it a mutual state of urbanization. The people become stable. And so how they can manage their people in, in, the, in, the, in a stage of rapid urbanization. So we need to learn on that. And also how we can find some general rules of people movement from rural to the cities. And we need a general knowledge about that. So that, that means we need to know, we need to know not only the cities, the, the things happening in China, we also need to know the things happening in other countries. That's, that's the reason we need to uh, work together. And also, I understand that uh, there are very, very fast, uh, very good organizations in India too, and also in Africa, and also other you know, so, uh, countries, developed countries. So I think this is a very good chance to make this urban science, urban, this urban science, you know, into, the, into this, this disciplinary research areas come to, you know, come to including uh, China and other developing countries as well. So according to my experiences, you know, for example, when, when, I, when I do research at Peking University, I uh, cooperate with some colleagues from uh, Cambridge University and also uh, Oxford University, because my research areas yes, mainly may focus on the transportation or transport modeling or forecast things. So I cooperate with them to study some cases in, in, in Beijing or in, in China and other cities. And then we, you know, share some comments and share some ideas how we can do that. I think it's really, uh, really, uh, it's, it's a time where, you know, we need to cooperate to do this, in you know, particularly for, 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 for some green, for some cities growing very fast. And uh, in China cities, because many researchers now have never seen such big challenges or big uh, rapid changes in the past two or three decades. We need no different knowledge from different contexts. So we can mix it and learn it and retransfer it to local, some uh, guidelines or local policy recommendations to get local governors. So I think that's very important to, 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 to cooperate with our international partners, particularly in this new era of urban science. You know, as we know that urban science actually is quite a new topic. And uh, because this, you know, starts with some from, from scholars from the UK or US, and uh, some big names there, Michael Bickle, or just like that, Michael Bate. So, and actually that new urban science really depends on some uh, new technicals or big data or some, uh, since so, I think we need to co uh, cooperate together with different researchers to 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 ex to observe or to study the local cases and then make the local cases, uh, you know, to an international to tell international story so we can find some general problem general rules. So that's uh, yeah, that's I think from me and. Uh, I would say, yeah, that's a, that's a very high uh, nationality for uh, international cooperation in this new urban uh, senses, particularly for China researchers, they are, they are, they are keen to cooperate with outside, uh, outside or overseas researchers to, to, to see how to explain and to, to find how China's cities, why China cities grow just like this. 
So, and also, uh, I think, you know, we, we, we are cooperating not, not only with this, uh, with other countries, developed countries, also we need to cooperate with the India or Africa, developing countries, so we can know each other, we can learn from each other. Yeah, that's for me, our. Thank you, uh, Panjong. That I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Peak has given us the opportunity not only to see what's happening in Beijing from your eyes, but also sort of comparatively in, in many ways, because what you were saying is absolutely correct. What the, you know, this wave that we've seen happening in China from the, let's say early 1990s to now is starting to move through South Asia. And then uh, in fact, when it comes through Africa, it's going to become a tsunami over the next 20 or 30 years, because the African urbanization is completely unprecedented from such a small base, you know, China and, and, and South Asia or have had historically strong urban cultures, but for Africa to go from, you know, 20 or 50 million people uh, about a century ago in cities to a billion is going to be a remarkable change, not only technical, but cultural, um, et cetera. And, you know, so you've seen this from a ringside view uh, as we've tried to construct this sort of global urban agenda uh, in, 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 in some ways. Uh, so, I mean, it will be very interesting to sort of reflect on how one connects the experience in Africa and of course, many of the new agendas that are sort of coming together, not only the new urban agenda, but questions of biodiversity, which are coming up very critically as we have to provide food and, you know, um, water and other services. Uh, the, 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 the big, big challenges we've seen in Durban sort of come to mind just about a month, month old, but also questions of, of climate change. These are emerging challenges, uh, which we've sort of not conceived of in the past. And whether it's fun cities in China, all the kind of challenges that you've had to deal with, uh, sort of responding to apartheid uh, in, in, in Africa, where transportation in a sense is the core element of trying to uh, sort of to, to balance out the spatial divide. So, um, you know, it'll be wonderful to hear from you on how this connection between the local to the global and back, like Pang Jong was saying, uh, and the attempt to create new knowledges, you know, science is one element of it, but there are other knowledges that, that, that are being created as we speak. Uh, in the humanities and the social sciences, uh, how you see that actually playing itself out? Uh, thanks, Aro. And um, I, I think one of the things which is really nice about engaging the MOOC, um, as people register for it and begin to take up um, and work their way through it, is you get a lot of different voices from people grounded in different cities on exactly this question that Michael was trying to talk about of how do we take a slightly different disposition on the urban, one which recognizes that things are complex, happening fast, happening in different ways in different places, but are happening across a range of social and technical and political changes that are transforming our world. Um, so you know, clearly the scale of urbanization in India or China is very evident at the moment and one sees that but if you're sitting in a city or in a rural area of Africa and in your lifetime things are changing you need to understand that and if you are trying to be involved in managing that process then you need to be thinking about it and even if you're living in Latin America and you've been in a context where they've been cities for some time but you are faced with actually engaging those changes and engaging the realities of new urban spaces. You need to find ways to think about, to approach, to understand, to implement, uh, which are commensurate with the problems. And the problems are big. <laughs> um, and it, that's a fantastic and exciting field to be in. Um, and I think what has been refreshing about the peak program and I hope you will find refreshing in the MOOC is that there's a dialogue between places um, about what that means and sometimes when you see not the same problem somewhere else um, although that is also reassuring because you can look and compare notes on on how you you can come about it but when you're able to sit back and say how can we approach this collectively that is refreshing, that is emboldening, that is what is really helpful. And so what I think the trans, the urban disposition that Michael spoke about, that is complex, understands complexity, recognizes the imperative for new knowledge, 
assumes that that is an interdisciplinary kind of knowledge, but also one that where the parts of knowledge which sit in different disciplines and professions and residents and states can be brought together. In other words, it's not something which is so intractable, we can't bring it together. That is helped by what we call this translational mode, where we start off from the assumption that we want to solve problems. So if you're the kind of person who wants to understand the problem, wants to help design a problem, and probably wants to be involved in implementing it, we think that this methodology, if you like, of being having a translational approach to knowledge is helpful. And we think a disposition which embraces the components which are spelt out through P-E-A-K, the peak disposition, which the MOOC goes into detail on, is really helpful. And our, that I think is particularly reassuring when you're sitting on the African continent, uh, where you are not, you're aware that there is even more to come than what you are already engaging. I think if you're sitting in China and India, you're in the middle of it. If you're sitting in Latin America or Europe, you probably are trying to address, nuance, amend some of what wasn't done very well. But if you're in the African continent, you really can begin to think that perhaps you can do things differently from the first. And just very briefly, if, if, I've, if I've got time to talk about why I think that is helpful to think about that globally, not just locally. I think when we come together and say, does it matter how colleagues in Africa do urbanization? We know that it does. Okay, it matters not just for them, but it matters for everybody because the way Chinese cities are built, the way Indian cities are built, the way Latin American cities are built, the way European cities and American cities were built has put us in the position that we are in. So what happens in Africa matters. It matters for climate change, it matters for biodiversity, it matters for global economic development and financial flows. So there's a local component to thinking translate in a, a translational kind of way, but there is also a global component. And I think that's the context where things like the sustainable development goals are helpful because they help to set out a normative position. And so increasingly what you've seen are two things. One, the scientific community beginning to talk about a global urban science, okay? Helped along, not exclusively a big data approach, there's room for anthropologists there too, but at the same time, the, the wider intellectual community, and I hope that there are some people who do the MOOC, who are in practice, who are beginning to say, we have to think about the values that we want in cities. Personally, I think it's helpful to say, what does this mean in Africa? Because that's a good litmus test. But why don't you listen to the cases in the MOOC and see whether you can make it apply in Indonesia, wherever it is that you're sitting. Um, I think that's helpful. And that's what we mean by global urban agenda. Uh, thanks, Sue. So, I mean, just picking up on that, uh, you know, uh, Pangjun, I think, that, you know, at least my own experience is, you, you know, we go to China and you go to a city like Xi'an and you see the history of urbanization sort of emerging before you, 2,500 years. Um, and, you know, the translation of that in the current context, uh, and then you come to a, a you know, a dramatic pop-up kind of city uh, in like, you know, Shenzhen and how it's actually just completely transformed or even Shanghai for that matter, uh, uh, you know, how, how uh, Pudong has kind of just dramatically exploded over the last 20 or 30 years. So I think there are lots of things uh, that we, we, we need to build on and learn from uh, in terms of the Chinese experience both the challenges, uh, but also the ways of dealing with things. So let me give you, I mean, from my point of view, my own lived experience, two examples. One is the, the building out of high-speed rail. Uh, you know, high-speed rail was something that was thought to be things that would work only in rich uh, and very well endowed countries, fine. But the way China has kind of uh, invested and connecting up now pretty much all of its larger urban centers with high-speed rail puts it in a unique position to deal with the challenges of climate change uh, for the 21st century, because not only people movement, but also the movement of goods and logistics becomes much more efficient and effective. 
Uh, and I guess the questions that emerge are, you know, for, for, for parts of South Asia or for Africa, are these the kind of things that we should be looking forward to? Um, you know, can, can, can countries really afford this? At what stage of development and urbanization does one pick that up? Or more recently, the massive, and this has happened, I think, uh, you know, literally over the period of COVID, the massive uh, transition in, in uh, vehicle ownership in China towards electrification. So, you know, one's seen it starting with electric buses, but now if you look at the car fleets, et cetera, there's a big shift that's taking place apart from your metro system. So even in the transportation domain, uh, which is really critical for urban functioning, et cetera, uh, they are in very, very interesting experiences of making choices. And I, I know from colleagues in China, uh, a great debate that sort of opened up for the last 20 years of whether you should invest in infrastructure uh, or you should sort of also invest in people um, and you know social protection and or the social safety nets. And in a sense, China made a choice uh, of investing very strongly on infrastructure. Whether that works for, for, for China itself, uh, what are the sort of underlying challenges and what are the elements of this that we can draw upon uh, as we go to sort of other geographies. So, you know, some reflections on that might be quite interesting. And then maybe one, yeah, Carlos, we, we can pick up later on what we can learn from Latin American cities. I mean, uh, so, First, uh, Panjong, just some reflections on that to connect in with what, what Sue was saying about lessons we can learn from across the world from China. Okay, thanks, thanks, Amar. I also thank you. So actually, yeah, what, what you just thought is a, is, a, is a big, there's a lot of big uh, changes happening. And also these changes, you know, it's, it's look like it's, uh, they, they won't, you know, turn around and they just, just go forward. And it changed to become very deep, deep in uh, social society of China. For example, the high speed, actually, high speed railway system totally changed the, this so large area of country. You know, it's the, this, you know, the people, the, the young people, and they could easily find a job. And it's a job market become larger and larger. And also, you know, I did the research. And uh, three years ago, and I also I gave the presentation in you know, a university of Manchester, and uh, I so and uh, my, my my research uh, main conclusion is that you know the larger city benefit more from the high speed uh, infrastructure than small cities at this stage because when this high speed railway was built, you find that small cities will lost their labors, and also some financial sources or other sources they you know they move into the big cities and big cities become larger and larger and richer and richer. So that's a big challenge actually. And you know there's ever since just like one call had two sides. High speed is a good thing and make people you know so move from here to there is easily and you can uh, you can you know have a breakfast at this 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 city and then you can have that, uh, you know, like dinner in another city in Xi'an, a breakfast in Beijing from Beijing to Xi'an. You really take, if you take the normal train, it would take 24, 27 hours. But now it's just the six or uh, four hours, five and a half hours. That's me, okay. Morning, I just have breakfast here, night and there. And I think, I just think it is good to, you know, make the differences between the differences in culture. And the consumption, you know, consumption uh, things between the two cities become smaller, but also this bring big challenges to uh, Xi'an because many, many, you know, new, uh, many skilled workers they move to Beijing because Beijing the salary in Beijing is high. Why, you know, I just live in the Xi'an and then find job in Beijing. So you will find you will see that Xi'an will lost some highly you know, talent, talented workers. So that's also, you know, challenges and uh, opportunities, they both coexist for these new techniques. Another big challenges I think I want to share with you is that the sharing transport, you just mentioned that, you know, we share bicycle share, car share, everything. It's, now it's, it's uh, the sharing economic become very common, very common in, in China cities. You know, use your mobile phone, you can order any car, not, not, not just normal taxis, they just, you know, the, some persons work at the daytime and after the, after five or six o'clock, they find part jam, they, they just drive their car and park on the roadside, they are reaching for the order from the internet. So the people just easily, 
they share cars, they share bicycles, they share things. So this has become a very uh, new trend since. So, but also this brings a big challenge to government to manage that because for sharing car, you, you, you know, everywhere, they need, they need you know, uh, management. And also there's some, uh, some social, you know, risk if you take some sharing car, you know, so it's a strange people, you know, so you drive that car, they pick up you from some place to other place. So I, I think there's also opportunity and, and challenges. And also I would, I, the third things I want to see the big, big act challenges is new technicals change our uh, culture of society. This is could be a very long term, and it's uh, because you know in you know, a MOOC, and uh, I I I give lecture about uh, transmodal modeling, but actually, it's for future travel behavior. You will see that behavior they totally change. The young people they are used to. Stay at home, they order everything from online. They just clink one coke one coca-cola, clink one, you know, bottle of, uh, one, one, one bottle of coffee, a cup of coffee, because it's this is much easier in China. Do you know why? Because our labor is cheap. There's a lot of lots of you know logistics, the people they drive that and uh, uh, motor car, they easily to send everything. So this actually uh the, this is low cost of logistic, that means, okay, our uh, transport cost is low and the people are easily can, can, they can afford online shopping since everywhere. And so that's, that's, that's a culture change. And not only young people, the middle-aged people, they just, you know, stay, they like to order, order some food from online. They like order everything from online. And even that's, the, you know, so, the, the, the young, the old generation, uh, the, you know, so for, the, for, for the elderly people, they started to do online shopping. They start learn that. Mm -hmm. So that's the big market. So, so everything, is, it's, uh, this is a very, it's a, it's a long-term change. The people, they, 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 they are now used to, to online commuting. But how about face-to-face? -face? And you, we, are, we are, you know, we are the human beings, we need to talk it. We need to see each other. And so that's very important. These long-term challenges, actually. And also uh, for, for our researchers, it's quite hard to see this uh, behavior change to modeling that. You know, I'm trying to model how to use modeling that is new change. So yeah, that's my uh, you know, uh, responses to, to Amr. So that, that's very good, very great comments on that. Thanks, Amr. No, no, th thanks so much. So Guan, I mean, I think some of the most interesting lessons that many of us learned in this whole sort of, you know, journey for the last five years is actually coming and seeing uh, how you have managed in Colombia and particularly in Medellin, right? Medellin has become sort of world famous for a whole range of creative things that have happened there. But I think the, I mean, when we look talking about emergence, uh, if you only focus on the experience of, of European or North American cities, uh, which tend to converge to particular stable patterns of development, as Peng Zhang was saying, you don't really actually capture the challenges that you've dealt with very successfully in, 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 uh, in, in Medellin, for example. The extreme violence, basically the city uh, working very, very far from equilibrium, uh, uh, you know, on, on all its counts in terms of informality, in terms of, you know, conflict, etc. And yet, in spite of that, um, your colleagues and yourselves you know, running a remarkable educational institution there, uh, making the connection between what is happening on the ground and the research that you have and bring that back into and being able to transform the city uh, and sort of bringing it back to a very different pathway from what, what it was on. So I think that's a, that's a very in inspiring story because many of our cities may well go the Medellin way or the way of Rio or, you know, or Sao Paulo, et cetera, large, deeply divided, uh, highly unequal in some senses, but experiencing all the forces we just uh, talked about, you know, technology at one end, uh, you know, rapid uh, expansion at the other end, serious resource challenges. So I think uh, for us, at least for me personally, uh, that learning was, 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 was very, very important. Uh, almost as important as actually seeing Cuba and the fact that a very different form of urbanization is possible, uh, if, you know, if, if the boundary conditions uh, change. So I think it'll be fantastic if you can give us 
you know, insights of how you people have actually managed this process and how one can sort of shape urban futures by linking research and practice uh, from the work of RISE, uh, from the work that we've seen done remarkably in, in Colombia. Thank you, Amar, and thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, yeah, like mm, everybody here in the audience know, uh, ha, ha, has listened about informality, inequality, lack of accessibility. And if I say those, those words, people from uh, India may be thinking of a specific situation. People from Medellin, if I talk about informality, they, they have an idea about what informality is in Medellin. Um, so we agree that we, they are global challenges, but once you take that global challenge and locate the challenge in a city, that challenge interact with the specificity, the, like the DNA of the city, and takes on interesting nuances that preclude the, the use of a standardized solution. Yeah, uh, and, and this is why it's very important to, to to have like the experience of cities in Latin America combined with the cities, uh, the experience with cities in, in, in India, in China. Um, because for example, as you said, like in Medellin, we have done uh, very interesting uh, innovations. For example, the cable car, okay? The cable car worked very well in Medellin and a huge impact, but it doesn't mean that we can take exactly the same model and put it in, in Peru or, or in, in India. It, you, you have to, to, to deal with the specificity of the city to make that solution work in other places. And the same happens uh, the other way around. For example, accessibility, like uh, designing bike paths, okay? There are many models, to, to um, uh, mat mathematic models, very fancy models, to, to, to draw bike paths. But when you try to run those models in Medellin, you realize that they don't work as well as they work in Europe because Medellin has specific uh, characteristics that, that make it difficult for those models to work uh, as, as they were uh, designed in, in, in other places. Um, so, um, when you have researchers like in Peak Project, researchers from uh, around the world sharing those experiences, sharing how those global challenge um, behave in different places, uh, it helps us as a community, and I hope it's gonna help uh, the, the students in, in, the, in the MOOC to get a better understanding of those global challenges. Yeah, that, that, that's the, 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 an important goal there. Um, so the, the, the students will be able to identify that accessibility challenge, challenges in India are way different from those in, in, in Medellin, or that informal settlements are very different in, 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 in different cities, and even within the city, informal settlements are, are, are very different. So that helps us to get a better understanding of, uh, of those challenges, and more important to produce even better theory. That if you have a better understanding of the problem, you 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 as a community can provide can, can make a better uh, urban theory, and also like if we if you do that with the participation of people from from the global south, um, you you can like overcome the situation of the you know of the global north uh, producing uh, urban theory. No, we are contributing to that. Uh, so, uh, so if I were to pick up that point, uh, Juan Carlos, you know, the thing is uh, a lot of practitioners across the world, you know, both in the global south and the north would, you know, would, 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 would sort of make the, 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 the claim that you don't really need urban theory, fine. The practice is good enough and we can bring high-speed rail or, you know, we can set up a new system for social protection or we can do housing, et cetera, without the practice. And, uh, you know, without the theory. But I think what, what we're learning, and I think this is something that we've really been able to do collectively and co-create through the PEAK program and, and many other kind of initiatives, is the fact that theory is very important for two or three things. You cannot scale without actually having good theory. And, you know, scaling is multidimensional. So you have to examine how the theory breaks down in particular contexts, like 
Pangjan was saying, there are great advantages of a particular innovation, but it also, also has its downsides. Uh, similarly, when you're looking at a different social or cultural context, how do you take something which is in a different cultural context and then apply it, whether it's you know, physic, uh, a techno, uh, technical system like a cable car, or you know, a program like you know, Brazil had to try and decrease inequality, which you find in, mo in most cities across, uh, across the world. So the theory is very critical, but I think we're building theory a little bit differently from what it would be done uh, like in the 20th century, where you, know, you build it as sociologists or transportation planners or economists or anthropologists, et cetera. The city forces you to bring all of these ideas together, fine? And in that sense, it's, it's sort of hybridized uh, this kind of these kind of processes. So, um, in in the work that you've done, which uh, you know we've seen very effectively applied in 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 Medellin, you're you're taking you know advanced uh, models. You're using remote sensing, which is now available across the world, using advanced mathematical techniques, but also applying it to questions yeah. of social conflict and access. Fine, and that's that's a new kind of theory. I mean, neither transformation planners nor uh, modelers. Um, no anthropologist, uh, you know, typically build this kind of theory. So any reflections on how this actually works in practice, what your experience is like, and how we've tried to bring this, um, these ways of knowing and doing into this MOOC? Yeah, thank, thanks for, for the question. Yeah, it's true, like you, you take the, 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 the local uh, uh, experience, build the theory, but the other challenges try to take the, that theory to the ground. And that brings you a, like a lot of new challenges that that uh, many times you you don't expect you know um let, let me let, let me give you an example that is in fact in, in the MOOC um, 12 years ago we developed this very fancy model econometric model for for the utility company in Colombia called EPM so we, we built this model to predict, uh, water consumption in the metropolitan area of Medellin. Beautiful model, uh, and, but the model used very fancy specific uh, data. So uh, EPN, the company was so happy using the model, but when they tried to use the model in other places, it was impossible because they don't have that uh, quality of data in other places, okay? Um, so you have a really nice theory, you have a, a nice paper with the model, but when you want to use it in other place, it doesn't work because you don't have the data. And this is something that we learned uh, during the peak, pro the, the peak uh, project, and we try to, to, to present those, those challenges in the MOOC, is that uh, we, like, if you want, uh, and, and we do that in right, like, in, 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 in PIG, we, we develop a new model, a new model that doesn't require this type of data. We explore new forms of data, satellite, satellite images, for example. And we don't use econometric model, we use machine learning. And then we end building a completely new model to predict urban growth, to predict water consumption that doesn't require the type of data EPN uh, was using uh, during those 12 years. Um, the result was that EPN bought that new model and is using that in Urawa. I don't know, Urawa, you, I, you, you, know, you, you know where Urawa is? It's a very deprived uh, region in, in Colombia. Uh, of course, they don't have the data, they don't have the technology, but now EPN is, is, is now can use our model there. No. Um, and the second example is like how, how like you, you are prepared, you are well prepared uh, with, with your theory, with your models, and then the pandemic come and the governor's office call you and, and ask you to develop, yeah, like you have 36 hours to tell me whether I have to lock down all the municipalities in Antioquia or not necessarily all of them. And if, if, if I don't have to close all of them, which one should I close and which ones should I uh, ha, uh, leave open? Uh, you have 36, 36 hours to answer that question. So those challenges require a perfect balance between the, the, the um, robust and, and the rigorosity of the methodology, 
but also you have to balance with time, with the scarcity of data, you know, and the MOOC is plenty of those examples in which the world, the, the world is not perfect. You have to balance those, those situations and came out with good uh, solutions for real practical problems. You know, so we end ans answering that question in 36 hours um, and we, we, we were able to help the governor office to, to deal at least a little bit with, with the pandemic. But uh, as a conclusion, you, you need to develop uh, a, a whole new set of skills to be able to take the theory into, into the ground and make the, the difference and uh, try to contribute to, to improve quality of life of population uh, within the city. You see, Aramar, I, I, I think what what, uh, what what Juan Carlos describes, which is what you're you're hinting at, is that there's a there's a part of what we're calling the the disposition of, of, of peak urban actually implies a different sort of relationship between theory and practice. I mean, I think Corbusier flew over Rio de Janeiro and planned Chandigarh. One became the other by mistake, and uh, Corbusier said, "You you 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 fly, you see, you know, and you decide." Right, and um, that's the that's the problematic relationship between theory and practice. Whereas, in a sense, what we're talking about in invoking a notion of translational uh, research, translational work, is, is thinking about colleagues who I think all share a sense of embeddedness in in context. So, the operational space at which they're working involves much more of, of a dialogue back and forth uh, the, the, about the relationship between theory and practice, which is why the MOOC is called working across theory and practice, not from theory to practice or from practice yeah. to theory, but a much more inter interactive uh, relationship between the two, I think. No, Michael, that's absolutely, the is, I think. No, that's absolutely true uh, in the sense that, you know, this is what we're trying to do to, to be able to enable that cycling of, 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 of knowledges. And this is what we've tried to do at IHS for many years. In fact, the reason that we got into MOOCs was to be able to take this experience and reach out, hopefully, to hundreds of thousands of people who are actually experiencing th this as researchers, as educators, and as practitioners, uh, but don't really have the opportunity because of the context that they're in. Uh, but this gives us a wonderful landscape right across the world where you know we're not hiding from difficult questions. These are wicked problems. And yeah. there are sort of contextual hyperlocal solutions that are there, but there's also theory that sort of underpins it. So I guess as we're about to close, the question that I have, which might be a little naughty question is, this is probably the second MOOC that the University of Oxford has actually put together. Uh, so for an institution that sits, you know, on the top of the, the totem pole, so to speak, um, you know, how has it been for you um, now as an anthropologist, fine, reflecting on the process that's there, what did we learn from the process of bringing together these contexts across the world and, and trying to make them accessible to, um, to younger and older people uh, and what are your kind of expectations from that as we are about to close? I, I think more than anything, I would say it is the importance of the importance of trust and trust relations. And only through trust relations can we generate these forms of knowledge, precisely because we know uh, the challenges are enormous. The, the importance of addressing those challenges therefore becomes commensurably significant and this the solution to those challenges is not going to be fine found through any one location that geographically and can only be generated through much more complex geometries of, of place and space and linking between the endeavors of people across the planet i think to address problems that are locally that can only be globally solved through those sorts of collaboration that land locally sensitively Thanks, uh, Michael. So with that, I mean, for those of you who found this interesting, the Massive Open Online course and the underlying materials that support this uh, and support the implementation of these sort of complex questions that sustainable development tries to address uh, are available now and they're openly available across the world. And we hope you can join us uh, and engage with researchers and practices from four continents. And we really thank uh, the ICST for the opportunity to bring this all together uh, and you know, try and engage with the question of how do we actually create these new knowledges and how do we uh, enable education for sustainable development to become real, grounded, and focused on impact. So thank you so much. Very many thanks.